and uh, it will be there for posterity's sake. Uh, please let us know if you have any questions. I believe Chris has opened up the, um, the Q&A window. Um, so at any point during today's webinar, please feel free to pop any questions you have into there. And we'll also, as always, try and leave a few minutes at the end of the session um, for Q&A as well. Um, so with that, uh, Chris Sheridan, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today on Office 2016. Uh, today we're going to talk about sort of that modern Office experience, what's going on with the Microsoft solution set, what are those new features and functions uh, Microsoft is introducing, as well as some of the philosophical changes that are going on with inside of Microsoft as it relates to Windows 10 and Office, and how... Uh, as an IT organization uh, responsible for managing compliance and security, some of the changes we may need to make as an organization over the next uh, uh, year or two to adjust our policies and procedures in order to be in alignment with how software is rolled out today and how app dev and, and software development is going on in the, in the modern desktop uh, and uh, across all the productivity applications. Uh, again, I did open the Q&A window, so if there's any questions, feel free to post them there. I'll check it from time to time. But with that, let's dive right in. So when we think about Office 2016, there's a, there's been this overarching theme, and if you've attended any of the webinars I've done over the uh, over the past few years, uh, there's this this statement that Microsoft uh, design concept that Microsoft has worked behind for several years now, uh, the right information to the right user at the right time, regardless of device. I'm going to say that again because it's very, I think, really key to this whole thing. The right information to the right user at the right time, regardless of device. I don't care what device you're on. I don't care where you're at. I need to get you the information you need in order to get your job done so that you can be productive. And that's sort of the design concept in theory uh, behind Office, Exchange, Skype for Business, uh, Windows, right? This has been uh, the change that Satya Nadella has brought uh, to the top of the Microsoft organization, really pushing this uh, overarching concept. So when we think about modern collaboration, right? Uh, what are those new, new features I kind of want to highlight and what are some of those new items that we really are excited about? So we're going to talk about uh, changes to Word and Office, changes to Skype for Business. And again, for those of you not familiar, Link has become Skype for Business. Uh, why the name change? Because everybody knows what Skype is. When I say the word Skype to 99.9% .9 of the user population, they know what it is. If they're not already using Link and I said Link, they wouldn't know what it is or what its feature or functionality set was. So thus the name change to Skype for Business. Um, other than that, it is just the next iteration of the Link product, but it did go through the name change. When we talk about modern conversations and modern collaboration, um, as well as changes in behavior with cloud attachments, and we're going to talk a lot about that and, and change behavior from a SharePoint standpoint uh, with Office, and then how we manage our inbox and version history improvements. So these are some of the things we're going to highlight. But really, the overarching theme here is going to be behavior change. Um, so when we think about some of the applications we've introduced over the past uh, you know, four or five years into our user base, ones that change users' behavior, ones that change how people work, uh, really challenge our user base, really challenge people uh, because it is, it's not so much a technology change. It's not that the button moved two inches to the left on the ribbon bar that's really the problem. It's more the how we're using the application, the features and functions behind that that are changing our workflow. That's why things like exchange upgrades are not particularly difficult from a user adoption standpoint because people tend to use exchange exactly the way they used the previous version, regardless of the new feature set. It's also why companies were always very slow to do exchange upgrades because users didn't really use the new feature sets. They used exactly what they used in the previous version uh, just uh, on, uh, on the new server. Whereas things like SharePoint and CRM, when introduced, radically change how an organization is working and change how uh, people are collaborating and connecting. 
Office is the tie-in to all of that. People don't realize that SharePoint is actually part of the Office suite. Uh, SharePoint is considered uh, in the Microsoft world, SharePoint and Office sit in the sort of the same group uh, because they are so integral to each other. So we're going to talk a lot about that as we move forward too. So what are some of those changes? Real-time co-authoring. So when we think about collaborating on a document, particularly one that's sitting in SharePoint today and doing co-authoring, meaning multiple people editing the document at the same time. If one person was using Word and another was using the browser-based version, Word Online, and was editing the document in the browser, the person in full-blown Word would not see what the, what the other person was typing while they were typing it. They would see that they were making edits, but they would not see what they were typing. Whereas in the browser, because it saves every keystroke as you hit it, the user in the browser would see what was being typed by the other person in the browser because they are seeing every keystroke. Whereas Word, it only saved when we hit the save button or if we had auto save turned on every minute or so. So people didn't see our changes. So we've edited that uh, across Word uh, and eventually it's going to be across Excel and PowerPoint as well where you'll see those changes as you're typing them. Um, it's to increase that collaboration. So when we're co-authoring a document, co-working on a document, we're going to see it as they're doing it. That change ultimately means we're going to be saving keystrokes as they're typed. Um, this makes version control very, very critical and version history very, very critical because if someone's making keystroke, you know, making changes to a document, they are automatically going to be saved. And once they're automatically saved, I may want to revert them. So that version history becomes very important when we talk about managing this. So when we think about that collaboration, we're really bringing a lot of that stuff that was browser-based into the on-premise app. And that's going to be a theme throughout the whole day, right? Microsoft is a cloud-first, mobility-first company. What does that mean? That means most of these feature sets, or a good chunk of these feature sets we're going to go over today, have existed in the browser-based versions of the applications for either several weeks, if not several months, some of them up to a year that they existed in the browser, and we're now bringing them to the on-prem applications. As we get to the end and we talk about upgrade cycles, you'll see how that will change too moving forward, but that's at least where we've been traditionally. So here's a really biggie, cloud-based attachments with an Outlook. So when we go to attach a file with an Outlook, instead of just processing local files, it's actually going to look for any cloud-based storage I have. Uh, so OneDrive, uh, file shares, uh, Microsoft even signed a large uh, co-op deal with Dropbox um, recently, right, uh, for for those companies who are already on Dropbox. If you're not already on Dropbox, of course, we, we want you to use OneDrive. It's much better. But again, that goes back to Satya's whole mindset of, yes, I want to crush my competition, but I also can't ignore them. I can't pretend like they don't exist. And a lot of people use Dropbox. So Microsoft built that integration with Dropbox as well. And this is a key fundamental change in the behavior of the application. Let's take SharePoint. For those of you not familiar with SharePoint, SharePoint has the ability to send a link instead of sending an actual file attachment. And this is the correct way to do document sharing so that we don't have email versioning problems, meaning someone drafts a, a Word document, sends it out to 10 people via email, one person edits it, sends it back out to 10 people, another person edits it, sends it back out to 10 people, et cetera, et cetera, till one person edits it, only sends it out to five of those people. And this continues, and now you've got 40 versions of the document in your inbox. Who has the correct one, et cetera, et cetera. So the correct way to do this is, of course, to send the file attachment. Well, the problem with Outlook always was if you go into your Outlook 2013 and you hit attach file, what does it allow you to do? Attach the file. That's it. It doesn't allow you to natively send a link. So users have to change their behavior. For 20 years, people have been going into Outlook, uh, grabbing, hitting attach file, attaching the file and emailing it. Now they would have to go to the Word document and hit share, or go to SharePoint, go to the website, click on the ellipses and share it. We're asking them to change their behavior from something that's been ingrained for 20 years. That doesn't work, and that's why traditionally companies have struggled with it. So what Microsoft has realized is if we want people to change their behavior, we have to change the applications they live in. 
like Outlook. So now when you hit attach file, it presents your OneNote, uh, OneDrive documents and your SharePoint documents. And when you click to share those, it will actually attach a link. It will look like it's attaching the file, but what it's actually attaching is simply a link to that document so that we're all editing the same document. No more email versioning problems, but also no retraining of users, no retraining people to do something different. They can now just simply go hit attach. What they've also done is it loads, as you can see in the image, maybe a little small, it adds your recent documents. So here are the last 10 documents you've been working on, regardless of location, because that's likely what you're going to be attaching. And if not, you can always hit browse and go find the document you're looking for. But um, it's also added that recent documents list so that you have that capability. So when we think about personal insights, kind of digging into some of those other areas, right? We really want to think about how to make use of that data that we have. So when we think about things like uh, modern charts, so within Excel uh, 2016, we've added all sorts of new uh, charts, tree maps, sunbursts, box and whisker, histograms, um, all of these different chart types that people who do either project management or finance or any type of analysis are very familiar with. And Microsoft has started adding these compelling ways to show your data, right? New ways to show your data and get it out there and then post that data into something like Power BI, uh, into your SharePoint sites so that people can gain access to it. I walk into most organizations and there's a lot of great data that that organization has created over the past, you know, uh, X number of years. But that data is sitting buried in a team folder or in a project site, and very few people are aware of that data that may be helpful to them in their project. So by tying it in with things like Power BI and making these Excel spreadsheets searchable through the browser, not just for file names, but the actual data within it, we make it a lot more powerful. So by presenting new charts, new ways to present data, we make data a lot more consumable by people, a lot more useful to people. So when we talk about some of that compliance piece, and this is where we're really getting into some of the different features and functions of the modern office, it's bringing data loss prevention, um, bringing, uh, bringing a lot of those security and controls, right? We go back to that initial slide, the right information to the right user at the right time, regardless of device. That sounds great, but the, the security flaw we've always had with that is that data with which we're sharing, that data with which we're letting people have access to from a mobile device or a personal device. How do we secure that? How do we control that content? And bringing those DLP extensions to Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, bringing those SharePoint policies so that they flow through to the document, through to OneDrive, so that that content, when it's taken from your network and brought locally to a device, your security and controls go with it. So if a document is sitting on my SharePoint library, well, to get to that SharePoint library, you had to authenticate through multi-factor authentication. So therefore, my document was nice and secure. So when you go to open the document, fine, I'll let you open it. But the minute you commence on a download action and grab that file from the SharePoint library and bring it local, I'm now going to encrypt. I am going to prevent copy paste, prevent screen capture, prevent printing, whatever it is that you need to prevent so that that data is not lost to you and that data is, its integrity is maintained. Give it a time to live. Yes, Mr. CFO, I'll let you download the payroll file to work while you're on the plane flying, but understand that document has a time to live of two days and every time you open it, you have to put in your password. Every time you open it, you know, you can't print it, you can't, you know, copy and paste because I'm, I'm securing that document. So we're bringing all of those DLP policies into Office. And the bigger part of this, too, is we're extending those DLP policies across all of the back applications. So in something like Office 365, there's something called the Office Graph, which is how all of the different applications are aware of each other. They're all integrated and all connected. 
what we're starting to do in Office 365 is integrate these DLP policies so that the same policy you've created in Exchange flows over to SharePoint, which flows down to Word, Excel, and PowerPoint when we're dealing with those documents so that you're creating your DLP or your security or your encryption policies once and then flowing it across all the various applications. It also makes the other applications aware. So let's take something like I'm sharing out a PowerPoint presentation right now. If say this PowerPoint were marked as private or if I had an Excel spreadsheet open marked as private, I'm doing a remote Skype for business session with you and I choose to share out my desktop with you. When I go to share out my desktop, Skype for Business is aware of the DLP policy, is aware this document is marked private, and grays out the document and doesn't allow me to share it via screen sharing because it is also aware of the security and controls we've placed on that piece of content. So we're taking all of that security and control, we're taking all of that information and now flowing it across all of the applications which then starts tying into conditional access. So when we start thinking about MDM, mobile device management, again, we go back to this, um, this how do we manage this data, right? Uh, when I've made it more mobile, we can do things like conditional access to any device. The device must be enrolled in, um, in our Intune or Office 365 management applications, right? It has to be part of my security. I have to have ensured that it's got the latest version of iOS or the latest updates from Microsoft or the latest security patches, whatever it is, an antivirus has been run before I will allow you to get on. Or we can go so far as to restrict it by say IP address range. If you are not VPN in, if you are not on the company network, I'm doing this for a bank right now, and they wanted to restrict only on the corporate network. Yes, you can bring your iPad in. Yes, you can get to access to our data, but only while you're in our building. Um, so they, uh, they restricted it down by IP address. So again, introducing that conditional access into office, into your data sets, uh, so that we can make it more empowered for people. We can make it more, uh, you know, make it, make it as mobile as we can by still having that security. You'll notice we're talking a lot about Office 365 because that really is the methodology for Microsoft moving forward, right? If you're not already aware, Office 365 is Microsoft's flagship product from a productivity standpoint. Are you going to be able to uh, have a traditional uh, old school enterprise agreement and install Office 2016 through an MSI package that way? Absolutely. Even if you subscribe to Office 365, you're going to have the ability to deploy it via SCCM or some other op, uh, uh, deployment package instead of through Office 365. Yes. But the cloud is Microsoft's uh, location for it. In fact, any Office 365 subscriber today, if your IT organization has enabled it, can go in and download an update to the 2016 bits, uh, the tech preview release. It's in the software panel of your individual Office 365 page that each user can go and grab it if you've enabled it as uh, an IT organization. So when we think about what we can control and what we can encrypt, you know, we can require passwords on devices, we can uh, prevent simple passwords on devices, require a certain number of characters, set timeout, set failure, uh, make sure the device isn't jailbroken, right? Basic MDM features. This is what Office 365 can do natively. If you're looking for more robust features, that's where Windows Intune comes into play, and Intune can do much more comparable to things like Mass360 or Mobile Iron, et cetera, et cetera. So when we're thinking about that modern uh, mobile environment, I can have Office on my iPad, I can have my OneDrive on my iPad, I can have my SharePoint on my, on my iPad, or my Surface tablet, or my Android device, and take that data with me take that information with me, you know that I'm secured, you know that it's all encrypted, and now I have access to it. 
So then we get into start doing selective wipe of Office data. So in Office 2016, uh, not just the data, but Office itself can become a managed app so that now when we're talking about that selective wipe, we can allow you to join your own personal device to uh, the network, join it through uh, uh, what's called a company portal application, download all of our managed apps. That includes Word, Excel, PowerPoint to your iPad, to your Android. So the latest versions of the mobile to clients are coming out. Microsoft has also recently released a full-blown Outlook client for the iPad and for the Android device. Now, why would we have an Outlook client and why would we be rolling out a 2016 Outlook client for these devices? Unified appearance for the user, right? The same look and feel. Whether they're using their Surface tablet, their laptop, or their iPad, we want them to have the same user experience as much as possible. But because these are all managed, because these are all tied to their credentials, because we've uh, secured it, we can delete all of our corporate data off of a personal device without interfering with the user's uh, without interfering with the user's data. So we can perform a selective wipe. The user themselves can perform a selective wipe simply by unenrolling the device. They can go and unenroll their own device and say this is no longer a part of the company and remove all the data themselves. It will automatically remove it. So when you think about these new Office features, uh, we're really securing it. And that's the key. You know, we've, you notice we spent the last four slides really talking about security of Office and controlling Office. Because when we think about that security and control, that's what enables mobility. That's what enables people to access their information from anywhere, anytime. When I know I have these controls and security protocols in order to lock down the, the environment. So now we think about that user experience. We think about that user uh, interface, right? Office has the ability to sort of give you feedback or tell you how to do things. You can tell Office what you want to do, uh, give it feedback. The templates it's built in when you're reorganizing a Word document. Uh, you can say, I would like this picture to be centered, and that's a lot more intuitive now. Reformatting Word documents, doing multiple columns, things like that were always very complicated before. Now you have the ability to interact with it, and the tool set is much more uh, is designed to allow people to sort of edit the content in their own ways and give them multiple templates of multiple views of if I did this in a double column or if I did this in a single column or if I centered this or if I moved it left, what would it look like before I do it to enable it? The one thing you will see in this photo, so the ribbon bar is minimized. The one thing I will say is the ribbon bar in 2016 is almost identical to the ribbon bar in 2013. Um, and that's very key because we remember the ribbon bar fiasco of 07. We remember users getting upset when the ribbon bar changed. So we want to minimize those changes. And that's a big, that's a big change and shift in the Microsoft philosophy, not only for Office, but for Windows, right? When we're going to talk about the upgrade cycles in a little bit, but we really need to make this as easy as possible for the users to transition. And we need to avoid these big three-year changes, right? Every three years, a new version comes out. We change 20 things, and users panic because it works differently than the previous version. Wouldn't it be much better if every month or every couple of months we released a new feature or two and rolled it out and let people get used to that one feature every couple of months so that we make it easier for user adoption? You know, anybody who studies education will tell you, you know, changing that one thing every month is much easier than changing 20 things every year. So that's really the mentality moving forward is after this version is to really move into that quick iteration, that quick update cycle. You will notice, too, as you've seen some of the screenshots, somewhat of a modern look and feel, meaning the ribbon bar across the top is going to have a slightly different look and feel. You're going to be able to do some different color scheme things. Um, 
less border space. You notice the ribbon bar is minimized. That's an option. They can still have the ribbon bar out uh, on display if they want it, but it's been made much easier to be minimized and the click to get to items much easier. And the reason for that is also on smaller devices. As people are getting more mobile, they're accessing it from Surface tablets or from smaller devices that are uh, that have less screen space. So we want to maximize that as much as possible. But if someone is on a larger screen, they can expand it out and have it work just the way it did before. Now, here's where we're going to spend a good, a good chunk of time over the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, really talking about the update management, the deployment management, and sort of the theories and changes of Office and Windows 10. We're going to throw in some Windows 10 here, too, because it really is a philosophical change in the way we're going to do desktop management over the next two or three years uh, from a Microsoft perspective. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honest. This is not, Microsoft's not breaking new ground here. Everybody else has been doing this. In fact, Microsoft's the last productivity company kind of doing it the old way. Everybody else uh, in the app dev world or software world, particularly from the productivity and desktop space, has shifted the way they do OS deployments and the way they do application updating. And Microsoft is realizing that's, that's what users need, what users want, and the way it is. From an IT perspective, though, it's going to necessitate some changes on our part and some behavior changes on our part for how we're doing things. So when we think about how we deploy software today, right? A new version of Office comes out. We do our testing. We do our planning. Uh, we roll out that new version of Office to batches of users at a time, uh, update them. Everybody's on the new version. Usually takes a few months, uh, depending on the size of the organization, You know, a few weeks to a few months. We get everybody up to speed. And now everybody's on the new version. We wait two years and repeat the process. In some cases, we wait six years and repeat the process. Uh, there are companies I know who literally just finished 2010 rollouts uh, for Office. And this is a problem. Often when I do presentations within organizations, um, we are uh, we talk about that sort of update cycle. We talk about that user adoption cycle and why they're not doing things quicker. And it's a cost benefit analysis, right? Uh, that companies do. What is the benefit to my users of rolling out version X versus what is going to be the IT headache? What is going to be my, uh, my task in IT to get this out? And what's it going to be the user's ability to learn to get this out? And if that cost benefit analysis doesn't work out, then, and then we delay. We also have SOX, we have HIPAA, we have other compliances we need to meet. What that leaves is when I end up going to most organizations and I ask the question, when I say innovative companies, what companies do you think of? The first word out of most people's mouths is not Microsoft, right? They think Google, they think Apple, they think, uh, you know, Amazon, they think all these other companies. They do not think Microsoft. So how do we change that mentality? How do we get that mentality of people thinking of Microsoft as an innovative company? Well, it's keeping people up to date. It's keeping people on the latest and greatest version. Well, that sounds good, but we have compliance. We have security. How do we do that? Those two things are sometimes in conflict. And that's really the change that's going to need to happen in the next few years, because this is going to be the road Microsoft's going to take. So when we think about it, Microsoft is, for both Windows 10 and Office 2016, is no longer going to have three-year release cycles. In fact, Office is going to be on a four-month release cycle moving forward. So when we think about what we call this deferred branch methodology of support, we're talking really about, I'm just going to finish expanding out the slide here, uh, what we're really talking about is, uh, you know, let's say January, and update drops for Office. That update will be in what we call uh, supported mode or, uh, or primary mode for the next three months. 
the next release will update, that previous release will now be in what we call extended support, right? Um, where it is still supported, it is still the version we want to support, and then it will be supported for a period of time. Then once the third release comes out, that first release is now no longer supported. It's now, all right, you're now two revisions back. So, and ultimately you're going to have eight months to roll out a, uh, at a minimum, uh, uh, roll out these updates, right? In the deferred branch uh, approach. There's another approach we'll talk about in a second, but in this deferred branch approach, you're really looking at these updates every, every four months, you're gonna get uh, feature updates. Now security updates are gonna come regularly, right? Every month you're gonna get security updates still, that's still happening, but the feature updates are gonna come those three times a year. Uh, I said four earlier, I'm sorry, I meant three times a year, every four months you're gonna get these uh, uh, feature updates uh, coming to your product. So that's really the, the methodology we'd like companies to be on because that gives you four months to test it, to make sure it works, to make sure there's nothing in that feature set that blows up. That's gonna change because most companies are used to doing this testing once every three years, right? Now the good thing is you're gonna have a lot less to test. It's gonna be well documented what features are coming out. Here's what you've gotta test make sure everything works, but we're gonna look at this rapid update cycle moving forward, not, uh, not slow releases. Windows 10 is gonna follow the same approach. There are not, Windows 10 is the last OS Microsoft intends to release, major OS they intend to release from the desktop. Uh, they really intend it to be, I call it the iPad model or the iOS model. When you think about upgrading your iOS device, for anybody on the call who has an iOS device, when you think about the process to upgrade that device, what do you do today? You go onto the device, you go into settings, go into general, hit software update. You walk away for 10, 20, 30 minutes, depending on the size of the update. You come back and the update's complete. You sign, log in your device, put in your code or whatever, and there are all your applications. You don't have to reconfigure anything. You don't have to redo your background or desktop or any of that. Your new version is there. You're just up and running. Windows and Office want to follow that same exact methodology. You get an update, you walk away for 10 minutes, and the new version of the OS is there. For anybody who's been demoing the Windows 10 technical preview, you've hopefully seen that in action over the past few months. And for those of you who haven't, I highly recommend you do, because it's a great way to see. Take a Windows 7 machine or a Windows 8 machine, download, uh, go to the Windows Insider program, and kick off a web-based update of that system to Windows 10. It will take about 40 minutes to do the initial install um, to take it from 7 to 10 or 8 to 10. And then you're on 10. And whenever a new build comes out, you're it, just like any other update. Hey, you've got an update. Let me know when you're ready. Reboot and we'll do the update. And when it's done, you're on the new build and all of your applications are still there. All of your settings are still there. All your printers are still there. Your Word app and Office app still work the same. So again, that's the methodology moving forward. This is probably the biggest shock to most IT organizations and how we're gonna approach the update cycle and how we're gonna approach the management cycle for our applications moving forward. Uh, this is where a lot of planning and time is gonna to need to be spent. The alternative to that approach is uh, you can stage these update and do a once a year approach where you can uh, stage them and say, okay, instead we're going to do uh, a once a year update or a once a year cycle for uh, active management, in which case we're going to stage everything and dump it out once a year, still be supported, but go on that yearly cycle. That's not the, uh, the best practices methodology because they intend to release enough features that that once a year update is gonna become much more massive, there's gonna be a lot more testing involved, and it's going to leave your users missing features. They're going to find features or buttons in their browser for SharePoint or for uh, Project Online or other things that would interact but are not available to them. 
right? So uh, really things that you want to make available, things like groups. For those of you who are Office 365 customers already, you're familiar with the new groups that exist within Exchange and the ability to have users create these distribution groups and, uh, for you know, shared calendar and a shared file space in OneDrive. Well, that feature set, those groups now appear in Office 2016, right? And that update came in one of the early technical previews. The initial technical previews wasn't there, but then you know the third or fourth build that they released, that feature was all of a sudden available. So as stuff comes to the cloud first, your users will see it there first, and then it will come on-prem. So one of the other things is also uh, activation. So for those of you not familiar with the way Office Pro Plus works with Office 365, your users log into Word now. Uh, they log into Office, so that way it's handling the activation. It handles the license check, and your users are still allowed, again, when you're doing it through Office 365, you still have that five user license or five copy license for each user. So that an individual user can have Office installed on five PCs. They can also have it installed on their mobile phone. They can also have it installed on five mobile devices. So they are uh, really getting some great use out of that additional license. And again, it's... Uh, giving you that ability to the user to manage their activation. It also gives IT the ability to manage that activation. So when we think about this roadmap, right, and this call really today was about the roadmap of everything in the Microsoft set, and this was the big slide that has kind of come out at the Worldwide Partner Conference this week, and when we think about dates, you know, the Office 2016 preview is out. You can download it. It is available. It's on its 10th or 11th build. Uh, at this point. The Mac preview is out. That's the other big change. Mac and PC are going to be on the same cycle for releases, that same update cycle, that same four months. So no longer will Macs be treated like second class citizens. You can also check the Windows Universal Office apps for Windows 10. You can also look at all the Office 365 if you're already an Office 365 subscriber. Those DLP and security enhancements have been released. Skype for Business which we talked about earlier, which is what we're using for this call today, is also already available. The bits for that dropped back on May 1st. So the Skype for Business bits. And upcoming through the rest of the year is going to be Skype for Business becoming a hosted PBX in the cloud so that your Office 365 subscription will be able to be a fully functional PBX in the cloud. Now the Office Graph is going to get more extensible across these 2016 apps and the other apps as we go through the rest of uh, the, the first half of this year, right? That Office Graph extensibility, I think, is set to drop in the next week or so. So what's coming up the rest of this year? Office 2016 is going to be set to release, uh, I believe in October was the last update I saw, sometime in the late September, October time frame. We're going to see SharePoint and Exchange uh, drop later this year. Exchange will actually go full release by the end of the year. Uh, the preview for SharePoint 2016 will be out by the end of the year. Um, and then full release in the first half of next year. OneDrive uh, for business sync, meaning that control and a lot of that conditional access is all going to go live. And then we're going to see full-blown Office for the Mac also release in that same September, October timeframe this fall. So again, we're going to see all of this drop in the second half of this year. Off of this list are things like System Center, ConfigMan, which are also being released in the second half of this year. There's a new version of ConfigMan. So when you look at this, there's a lot new coming out. And the way Microsoft is going to maintain their update cycles moving forward, it's going to be pretty aggressive. So we really, from a Windows 10 and uh, an Office 365 uh, Office standpoint, are really going to need to change our mindset on how we're managing uh, patching and how we're managing information. So with that, I'd like to, I'm going to go check the Q&A. So there's a Q&A tab uh, down on the bottom. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer them on, you know, different aspects of this. Uh, so we got one question already. What is the plan for Skype for Business on the Mac? So the Skype for Business client on the Mac is the preview has the new Skype for Business client. Uh, the Skype for Business client for the mobile devices is also 
uh, in various stages of release. We're actually testing it now. So actually on my Windows phone, I have the Skype for Business mobile client. The iOS one is out for technical preview. Um, it will be fully launched over the next uh, month or so. Uh, and then the full-blown Mac client is set to release with the Office for a Mac when it comes out um, uh, later on this year. So the Skype for Business full-on Mac client will release uh, around the same time with the uh, Office. Uh, I believe maybe even a little before. So uh, that's when the Skype for Business client for the Mac is due out. You know, some other common questions I hear are, you know, how how can I do this upgrade easier? Does, are there, what are the different methodologies from getting from 10 or 13 to 2016? Well, you can do it traditional MSI, just like you do today, where you can, you know, if you're using System Center or something like Alteris, you can write, uh, you know, your script, remove the previous version, install the latest version, do it through your MSI package exactly like you've done it before. But in Office 365, we also give you the ability to do click to run, where you can go to the cloud and a user simply can log in, and when they're ready, click and install the new version. So you can also do click to run if you want to run it on a more self-service basis and allow people to do it on their own. So that's entirely up to you, whether you want to push or pull it. Um, but that's, uh, those are the two methodologies. Click to run is great because the user doesn't need to have administrative rights. It will run it, it will get it installed locally, and then it will keep it up to date. Again, just like WSUS, you can queue up those updates and, and stage them when you're ready. But by default, it's going to be set to be on that four-month uh, update cycle. Uh, will Office 2016 require Windows 10? No, it will not require Windows 10. Uh, Office 2016 does run on Windows 8 and Windows 7. Uh, you'll find that from a code standpoint, application compatibility, right? When we talked about XP to Vista, right, or 2000 XP, one of the cost benefit analysis ratio things that always went into was my application testing, was my application compatibility. That's also part of the reason when Microsoft is changing their Windows 10 methodology and how they're doing their desktop OSs because that issue was probably one of the biggest deterrents to people migrating OS versions was the application compatibility. So what you'll see from 7 to 8 to 8, 1 to 10, there are, I have personally not run into a single application that has had application compatibility issues not saying there aren't any, I'm saying I have not run into any, they are very limited, right? Most applications that run on seven will run on eight, will run on 10. So when we think about application compatibility, we are uh, going backwards to that. You can directly upgrade from seven to 10. You do not have to upgrade to eight first. Um, so you can do that, that immediate skip jump. You can also do it in place. I can't stress that enough. The in-place upgrade, that automatic update, that iOS model, right? And hopefully to most IT people, this should not be too overwhelming because we've gotten used to it with Android and smartphones and iOS devices over the past four or five years where we've been doing these in-place upgrades and they work just fine. Right? We haven't done it into our Windows environment because, let's be honest, I've been teaching the uh, Microsoft certifications for many years. You know, the first thing you taught someone going, you know, for their Windows XP certification was, you know, on the first uh, Windows XP exam, it taught you how to do all the various flavors of an upgrade from 2000 XP. And the first thing you taught every engineer was, if I ever catch you doing this in the real world, I'll break both your thumbs because you need to do a rebuild. You need to re-image the machine because you don't want to carry through the old problems from the old machine to the new. And that was very true. Microsoft is changing the way their software works and the way Windows has been written so that it's not like that anymore. That in-place upgrade, that, that real-time uh, get the latest update and roll it out uh, mentality is there. So uh, you're going to see a lot more application compatibility uh, mindset moving forward within Microsoft. So no, it does not require Windows 10. You can run it on 7, 8, and 8.1. Um, although I will say, for those of you who aren't aware, Windows 7 is actually end of life. Windows 7 was end of life in January of this year. 
it's in extended support through 2020, um, but there are no more feature releases coming out for Windows 7. Windows 7 is purely in a security update mode at this point and end of life because it's about to be three versions back. Right? 8, 8.1, and 10 are going to be the three supported versions of Windows moving forward. So um, uh, Windows 7 is actually technically end of life within, uh, it's, I believe they call it end of basic support end of standard support within the Microsoft world. So you can actually not call the Microsoft help desk and get any support for Windows 7 without paying, right? Because it, it's out of basic support. So just food for thought, something uh, to be aware. We're also coming up, I believe the 15th is the official end date for server 2003, right? 2003, hits official true end of life, no more support, no more security updates on, uh, on, uh, the 15th of this month. So things to be aware of, dates to be aware of. Okay, not seeing any more questions. So how do you engage? How do you, uh, what are the next steps? Download the technical previews. Do in-place upgrades from Windows 7 and Windows 8.1 to Windows 10. Run Windows XP. You'll notice, even as I go back a slide here, you'll see that the server preview for 2016 is out. The server preview for the next version of Windows Server is already out. Microsoft, uh, Satya Nadella comes from a developer background, right? He's, he was a hardcore programmer and developer. So one of the big mindsets in Microsoft, and you've seen it with the last few applications, is really opening up the tech preview. There have been millions of people downloading the insider previews for uh, Office 16, for uh, Windows 10. And normally at this point, you know, Windows 10 is set to be released in two weeks you can still go to the Insider program and download the Insider preview. They have not cut off access to it. You're going to be able to do a direct upgrade to full-blown Windows 10 from the Insider preview version, something you couldn't do traditionally in the past with other Insider previews. Microsoft is really into this idea of collecting feedback because when we think about Windows 8 and the failure of Windows 8, was having a touch UI a bad thing? No. The problem was the industry wasn't quite there yet. Right, Only 5% of devices at that time were touchscreen devices. So because the industry wasn't ready yet, it wasn't well received by the user community. So Microsoft wants to uh, crowdsource or, or get feedback on what's working, what's not, have people try it out who are hardcore users, and give them feedback so that they can make a better product for you. So highly recommend download the Insider Preview, start using it, start playing with it, start testing against it, start seeing how your applications are working, start seeing how it integrates with other things. Do your research into Office 365. Um, make sure you vetted that out and vetted out the cloud and, and different ways of deploying it. If you're interested in doing a structured proof of concept for this or talking about rollout or adoption plans, definitely feel free to reach out to New Signature for any of these applications for Exchange, SharePoint, Skype for Business, CRM, which also has a new version coming out this fall, or any of these other applications. So definitely feel free to send those out, uh, you know, uh, send out those requests and we're happy to come on site and start working with you on some of these proof of concepts and start figuring out your upgrade order. What's the, if you're not already in Office 365, what's your roadmap to get from where you are today to these applications? <laughs>